hurting. I'm pretty sure you guys in your areas, you know a few people that are hurting. Go support them. They need it right now. If you can, if you can go out there and support them, do it. And this place is just better. Like it's just better than most. Well, we always figure though, and people will tell you. I mean, our audience will tell you, but we'll tell you also. The best place is, is always the corner, the corner place, the hole in the walls, the you know the ones that the owner is sitting there and they're waiting for you to go and order the food, and it might be a family member that's back there cooking it. You know what I'm saying? That they have that much appreciation for the food. It's not just going to be some manager that they hire. You know what I'm saying? Those are the best places because they care about and they care about their food. So they have great milkshakes too, but obviously. Ooh, yeah. uh, this is not like the most optimal temperature <laughs> for milkshakes, mm. so I couldn't pull the trigger on it. But <laughs> definitely milkshake place too. Yeah, we're gonna have to try it over the summer. By the way, if you're excuse me, if you're wondering, the temperature around here has been in the teens and even down to single digits, so it's not optimal for milk. I mean, I'm not. I I don't disappreciate milkshakes any time of the year, but I do agree. Probably not the best time. So, all right, well. So overall, the Super Bowl sucked for both of us, in, in a sense. Uh, it already sucked for me when my Niners were out of it, so I would, it, would, it is what it is. Um, and, but speaking of betting, because both Tyler and I had some bets on there. He had some prop bets along with the main bet. I had a main bet with a buddy of mine. But I kind of want to give a shout-out to the streaker if he really did make 374000 <laughs> I don't think they were paying him out. I, I can't, I, I just, that, that's that got to be some balls, though. I mean, I, don't yeah. get me wrong. I mean, even if he doesn't see all that, he doesn't see any of that money, the attention that he got yeah is was well worth the credit. Okay, I, I'm just going to say that off top of that. But it just doesn't seem real. $50,000 on a prop bet seems a little bit out far-fetched, in my opinion. Yeah. But then again, I mean, I don't, I'm not that huge of a gambler, so I don't know. Well, that's a lie. I'm not a huge <laughs> sports gambler, so I can't. It's a good thing. Mm-hmm. So, but I don't think they paid it out, man. I, I think you're right. You pro- you probably right. You probably. You know, I mean, I we'll keep up with the news on it, and we'll we'll see what happens. But you know, it's just I just think it's really hilarious. Although I mean, because there's been several. He's already had the stories out about what he's done, how he got the money, or how he even attended the game. Apparently this is this was his fourth try or his fifth try at a Super Bowl to try to do something like this. So, but <laughs> that was an interesting prop. I guess you could have looked up. <laughs> Would there be a streaker, you know, and put money on it and see what the odds were? Well, if you if you if you had the ability ability to be in four or five Super Bowls, you probably a fifty thousand dollar profit. It's probably nothing for you. I would. Uh, well, he apparently had sponsorship though too to get to the Super Bowl. So he used a uh, a Russian adult site. To help make some of the money in, I don't know what that. I don't know. So and probably the the, the money is probably not necessarily all his either. He probably he could have easily got fifty friends who put a thousand or twenty five friends. I mean, hell, we know that many people that'll put a thousand dollars on us doing something like that. Stupid. So you know it could happen. So, but the other reason why we're doing comfort food today, guys, because uh, we lost some really good people. Yeah. This weekend, you know, uh, biggest one for here at Kansas City. Is I well, there was two of them we really lost in Kansas City. That was big really ones. Hmm? big ones, two big ones. Yeah. Um, but RIP, Mark Schottenheimer, uh, Hall of Famer, by Hall the of Fa- oh, 100% Hall of Famer. No, and, that means you can't, you know, it kind of it kind of pisses me off that it's always once the guy dies, everybody likes to step up and talk about how great the coach he was. But the whole time while I was living, all anybody ever wanted to talk about was him not winning a championship mm-hmm. and him losing the playoffs. but... If you look at what the Chiefs have done the last two years, Andy Reid, Brett Feach, Patrick Mahomes, it's absolutely not possible without what Marty Schottenheimer and Carl Peterson did in the 90s. Because uh, anybody that's lived here and rooted for this team for as long um, as we have knows that the 80s, that place was a dump. Nobody was going to those games. Mm-hmm. And Marty Schottenheimer helped, uh, helped make this football town again. So... Right, because in the eighties, this was a baseball town. That is, it, I'll get out. I've heard that story multiple times being here. And give credit where credit's due. That Martin Schottenheimer really did bring back Kansas City Chiefs football as a mainstay here, well into the nineties. Um, 
And I will, and one of the things I will argue about Mario Scheinheimer is the fact that he's a great coach, great leader. <clears throat> and he never, in my opinion, there was only one questionable thing he did as a coach that I questioned, and it was the whole Rich Gannon versus Elvis Skurback situation. Um, actually, and that's what I was going to get into. That was um, the story behind that is that that was. More of a front office decision. And that's why I heard, too, later on down the road. Because of the embarrassment of what <clears throat> you had invested in Gerber. Right. So, which goes to show you what Seattle did when they had Matt Flynn in for a, I think it was like a 40 plus million dollar contract right before, and then they drafted Russell Wilson in the third round. And everyone's wondering why Russell Wilson starting in 2012, 2012, 2013, around that time yeah. frame. So it's literally if the person, whoever has the hot hand, you know, I think that's kind of where that comes from. But I heard the same story later down the road. But without a doubt, Marshawn Heimer, all, one of the best all-time great coaches to ever have coached in the NFL. And from all accounts from what I heard, excellent guy to get to know. I mean, he was very personable when it came to people. And you can't say that with a lot of people that are in that rank. Yes. Yeah. So for him to be at that level and to still be able to shake your hand, I got to give mad respect to anybody that does that. And at, at the end of the day, players got to make plays. Yes. Like, as much as we love to talk about coaching success and how important it is with the X's and O's, at the end of the day, players got to make plays. 100%. And you can't execute the X and O's. And, you know, Marty took the Browns to two AOC tile games. You had the drive and the fumble. I mean, how are you going to put that on that guy? You can't. You can't. You can't. Lynn Elliott, his kicker, missed three chip shots mm -hmm. when he had the best team in the AFC. Um, a stupid play in the the game when he was 14-2, the Chargers, that got him bounced. So, I mean, oh, just a lot of bad luck, really, on his end. 100%. Um, but, yeah, one of only seven guys, 200 wins. Is that correct? Something like that? Definitely less than 10. Yeah. Definitely less than 10. No, absolutely. He had a, a – and I am kind of curious what's going to happen to his son, Brian, though, because he just got released by Seattle, so I'm wondering where he's going to go next. So, yeah. well, I'm pretty sure he doesn't care right now. I mean, and I wouldn't either in this situation. So, you know, it's um, – And then, obviously, Trez Paylor. Oh, man. He was um, – anybody that uh, read his stuff or listened to him over on 610 uh, – he was just, he was one of those writers that really knew the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just, he was great to listen to. He was great to read. Um, it's, re it's really sad. It's really I, fucking sad. Man. I was shocked because he literally had a question uh, session with Mahomes and the guys at the Super Bowl. And then I find out two, two days later he passes. It's like, yeah. wow, that's, and he was young, 37, 38, something like that. He was there's, really young. There's not a lot of writers out there that you actually, think you're learning about football when you listen to them talk. Yep, that's he, true. He was one of them, for sure. He was not just an opinionated columnist. This man knew the yeah. game, ins and outs, and you wanted to hear him. Now, don't get me wrong. He was definitely a pro-Homer style fan. He wanted optimism for the fan bases. I agree. But when the man can talk to you about the X's and O's of the game the way he did, you, you definitely had to stand up and listen, especially if you want to learn the game that way. I mean, there's going to be fan bases that don't care. But even if you're a fan base that doesn't care about the X and O's, just listening to him speak about the game and his passion, yeah. that's what we're about. He's one of the very few guys, by the way, that because I talked about how there's, there's not a whole lot of analysts that I can appreciate um, with, their, with their opinions and so forth. I feel like they're kind of catering to a certain crowd or whatever. Drez Paler, in my opinion, was the most honest columnist in Kansas City and probably top 10 easily in the entire nation, um, but definitely loved the team and definitely loved the game. And I, I got to respect that about the man. So, absolutely. Yeah. He's, it's just sad. It's a ter terrible week here, guys. It's, it's been a terrible, terrible week for, yeah, if you're, if you're a big sports fan in Kansas City or you, you're a the true Kansas City fan of the fan bases when it comes to the sports things here. It's been kind of bad. But not just kind of, it's been really bad. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, baseball's not going to be the same without Pedro Gomez. Oh, too. 100%. Pedro Gomez was, I mean, there's baseball on ESPN, there's like 
four or five names. So obviously Tim Kirchin, Peter Gammons, um, you know, there's those list of guys that go way back to the early days of baseball tonight. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pedro Gomez, obviously. So that's uh, it's been it's been a week, man. It's been a week. It's been an unbelievable year. Obviously, we're in the twenty twenty one now, but twenty twenty were just absolute legends that we've lost in the yeah. past year, just across sports. Yeah. So and then now it's just hitting hard again in twenty twenty one. So and we're not leaving out Chris uh, Wesling, uh, NFL dot com either. Yeah. I mean that was pretty. That was also a really shocking loss too. So it's just it's always. It, it, for some people, they may not understand the compassion aspect of it, but no, here's the thing, guys. When you lose somebody in those backgrounds, in those areas that you're trying to learn from, it does take effect on you. So, yeah, so, yeah. it's it's a uh, it's never never fun to lose anybody in that nature, and the initial shock it still shocked us here. So, but their their memories will be honored, though. At least that's the good news. So, the, the way forward. that somebody that you've never met, never talked to, can mm-hmm. impact your life. You just feel like you know them. Mm-hmm. Uh, those guys definitely did, had a way of doing that. Mm-hmm. So, but, I mean, hope springs eternal. Mm-hmm. March is around the corner. That's true. And, I don't know, March might March might be one of the most underrated months on the sports calendar. Uh, actually, there's, oh, in my opinion, there's only two months that we really should pay attention to. And that's literally March is one, and the other one's October. <laughs> yeah, in my opinion, yeah, because October. March is literally when and, you know because you like you said it's spring, new new time, new year. Ba- uh, baseball season is just about to kick off. NCAA basketball becomes really hyped up and interesting. Second half of NBA basketball gets hyped up and interesting. Start of the new NFL season starts in March. I mean, and NASCAR is on full effect and running at that point as well. Soccer is getting uh, soccer is going to get off its feet and start moving. I mean, just all the sports happen right at the thick of things around the beginning of time in March. Yeah, March to into April. Mm-hmm. You have the tournament that takes you into like opening day in mm-hmm. the Masters. It's mm-hmm. just I, I'm really excited for the tournament this year because obviously we didn't get it last year, and Kansas lost a championship in my opinion, which they had a great night tonight. They destroyed Iowa State. Finals ninety seven sixty four, yeah, so, yeah. Unfortunately, their team's not looking that great. But okay. I don't, I don't pay attention a lot to the regular season stuff, anyways. Because what it comes down to is, does the team turn it up when it comes to the NCAA tournament? And there's, you're starting to get that feel with this team mm-hmm. because they just beat, they just beat Oklahoma State, yeah. destroyed Iowa State tonight, mm-hmm. and they're gonna go up to Ames and play Iowa State on back to back. Easy, easy win there, and then they got K State. So we're looking at a nice little four-game stretch here mm-hmm. before you close out the season with Texas Tech and Baylor. Mm-hmm. So if you get get hot right here and then you steal two of those big three at the end, yep. then you're looking at a team that's really trending upward in yes. time right before the tournament. And also, like, I think sometimes if you can get in as like a five or six seed, mm-hmm. sometimes the matchups tend to favor you more than when you're a, a one through three. Mm-hmm. So this is going to be interesting. It's probably going to be the first time that Bill Self is not a one through four seed. We're looking on that five or six line. So it's going to be interesting to see how the tournament plays out in that aspect because all it takes is, you know, right matchups and the ball bounces right. And the next thing you know, you're in the final four. So. You know what's interesting? You uh, pointed out to me this week. Uh, well, so we were going to try to do this on Monday, but we got iced in and it's been havoc. Yeah. But so we've been talking about what's been going on around, especially with college basketball and baseball coming up. Which, by the way, interesting trade that the interesting Royals trade that came up. Um, the uh, NCAA tournament is always a great time to watch, and everyone's always going to go with, well, who's number one, number two? We'll pick those guys. So I mean, Gonzaga and Baylor are now ruling the roost right now in the regular season. Right. However, Baylor's had a ton of games canceled. Yeah. So how's that going to affect them? That uh, could. But my biggest thing is this. You can never discount the blue blood schools, and especially when their back's against the wall. You know, I always feel like, especially knowing the fact that we we watch a lot of KU basketball, the year that they went to the NCAA finals with that, um, with uh, 
Tyshawn Taylor, Tyshawn Taylor, Thomas year. Robinson. Mm-hmm. That's obviously that's that's the best job Bill Self's done. One hundred percent because they overachieved with that team. They yeah. were not even supposed to make it out of exactly. the Sweet Sixteen. I mean, they made it into the Sweet Sixteen. It was a great year, and then they go into into the Elite Eight, and everyone's like, "Okay, great, you guys had a better year." Then you made the Final Four. Oh my God, this team legit. I mean, I feel like this team could be that team. But you could say the same thing about Duke. You could say the same thing about Kentucky. You could say the same thing about all these teams. Uh, North Carolina is the other one that they are consistent winners in the NCAA tournament, all because of one major factor, and that's coaching. That's true. I mean, the college game is different, obviously, because the turnover in players, mm-hmm. the one constant is always going to be your head coach. Yeah, and that those teams that like the Purdue's and uh, the uh, McNichol State and the Murray State teams and all those that had those seniors that have been there. Freshman year all the way up, that that chemistry. Those are the teams you do watch out for. You know those those uh, nine, ten, eleven, twelve seeds that could you know sneak in and get in. You know there might be another Portland State out there, or there might be another Lehigh or someone of that nature. So it's it, no matter what I and I'm going to say this now. I think we're in a time now more than ever that a sixteen team, a seeded sixteen, can compete with a number one. Year in, year out. And I'm not saying that they're going to blow them out. All I'm saying is they're going to make it competitive.